Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Horn Call Podcast. My name is James Bolden, Publications Editor for the International Horn Society, and your host. By the time you're hearing this uh, episode, uh, it should be about mid-February, and I hope that uh, your year has gotten off to a good start. Um, I hope that you're looking forward to uh, IHS 54, which will be at Texas A&M University Kingsville, August 1st through 6th. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing uh, friends that I've not had a chance to connect with in person in in a number of years, and I know that you are too. So uh, I I hope that uh, while I'm sure I can't see every single person and speak with every single person at IHS 54, I hope that I I get a chance to speak with as many people as possible. And uh, I uh, am really, really looking forward to that event for lots of up-to-date information about it, including registration and a schedule and lists of exhibitors, be sure to visit IHS54.com for all of the latest information. On to my guest for today. Uh, Professor Johanna Lundy is uh, the Assistant Professor of Horn at the University of Arizona and is also the principal horn in the Tucson Symphony Orchestra. Uh, She brings a very unique uh, uh, background to um, her work having done just about a little bit of everything, I think. Um, On a personal note, Johanna and I uh, go way back. We first uh, ran into each other at the Brevard Music Festival in North Carolina before, well, I guess it would have been probably just a little bit after uh, the turn of <laughs> of this century, so the early 2000s. I, I don't want to out myself uh, in terms of age too specifically, but uh, I think you're really going to enjoy uh, our conversation today. Um, Johanna is, in addition to her many academic and uh, professional performing accolades, she's also um, uh, a member of the Advisory Council of the Interna- of the International Horn Society and uh, the newly elected treasurer of the IHS. So she's going to talk today about um, the various skills that she brings to bear and all of the different things that she's doing. One thing we didn't get to talk about but that I, I, I think uh, Johanna wanted me to mention uh, was that in addition to her work as an orchestral performer, as a teacher, uh, her prior work uh, in, in development and fundraising, and her current work with the IHS, she also is interested in the relevance of classical music and social equity work, um, particularly with her group, the Borderlands Ensemble. So if you want to know more about that, uh, be sure to check out uh, her information online for more information about the Borderlands Ensemble. So without further delay, here is my conversation with Johanna Lundy. Yeah, so we've known each other a long time, and what I was saying just before uh, before we went on mic is, you know, you always struck me as someone who is so dedicated to her career and you know, you, it, it seemed to me that you had this vision of exactly what you wanted to do and you just kind of made it happen through your, your perseverance and, you know, talent, obviously, and hard work. And, you know, it, I think it's important for students uh, who kind of see people who are like, oh, you know, I, I don't know how that person got there. And, you know, they're, they're in an orchestra and they're teaching full time and they're doing all these amazing things. And then the student perspective is like, well, I don't know. I don't even know how to like put one foot in front of the other. I don't know how to get there. So I think it might be cool for you to maybe talk a little bit about your journey, about what what brought you to where you are and maybe some of the twists and turns, but you found that that actually gave you a lot of skills and reminded you of the skills that you got from being in music. Yeah. And I mean, I, I definitely, when I was a senior in high school, I, um, well, it, the summer before that I spent a little bit of time without my horn because I was, I was really fortunate. I was able to do a little study abroad program. I couldn't bring my instrument. And then I just decided, okay, I want to like take lessons. I want to try to get in the youth orchestra. And then it all happened kind of quickly. So I started taking lessons um, with Richard Dean Mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And, um, and then a couple months in or something, I told him, well, I think I want to major in music. And, he was like really amazing in that he didn't just say, 
uh, that's not going to work. Um, <laughs> so even though later he totally joked with me about it, he's like, uh, I didn't really think that was going to work out for you. <laughs> um, but you know, cause I had not really taken private horn lessons before that time. So it's kind of a late start. Um, but I, I did take piano lessons was when I was a kid. And I, I mean, I just had many years of music instruction kind of bouncing around in my brain. So mm-hmm. I was able to pick up with things quickly. I had a long way to go. Um, I managed to get in, um, to a couple schools. Um, I ended up going to Oberlin in Ohio. And then first year I studied with Dave Brockett, Mm -hmm. who's still in the area. And then, uh, the last three years I studied with Roland Pandolfi, who, who came there and began teaching. He also just recently retired, um, from Oberlin and he was really a unique teacher, um, in that, um, he is really a natural player. And I always felt like something that he was able to to share with his students was how to become a natural player, um, okay. which was really cool. I mean, it just it was a process that took like two years of me being totally confused. And then finally, like I got it. And um, it's amazing. Um, but it's it's a little bit it's quite a bit different than some of the pedagogy. I think that a lot of a lot of us know uh, as horn okay. players. So I, I did that. And then, um, I was able to start, um, getting into music festivals. So that was a huge thing. Um, I mean, I knew at that point, I really wanted to play in an orchestra. I, um, wanted to get that experience. So I went to the Aspen music festival. I was really fortunate that I was able to go there for five summers. Mm. And, um, that was a huge part of my training because they are, are one of the, one of the places that offers, um, the chance to play in orchestra with professionals, um, mm-hmm. with your teacher, um, as did Brevard, which mm-hmm. is where we first met. That's right. Um, and gosh, like, I mean, there's just no substitute for not just hearing your teacher perform, but actually playing with them. You learn so much from, um, um, it, it's like all these things that aren't spoken, you know, body mm-hmm. language and just like, how do they pick up their instrument? How soon do they have to start preparing um, before, you know, with the rests before they come in, how do they empty the water? Like how loud did they play? Mm-hmm. You know, the idea of anticipation and not playing behind the beat, all kinds of stuff. So um, that was huge. Um, I went on to uh, New England conservatory for my master's. I knew at that point that I just, I wanted a program that felt like a music festival. I just wanted to play mm-hmm. like all day. And that program was perfect for it. Um, so I had like NEC stuff all day. And then at night, I I won a couple of like regional orchestra jobs. So I was pretty much like going and playing an orchestra at night. Mm-hmm. So um, it was great for getting the experience. I knew that I needed that experience in order to get accepted into orchestral auditions. Um, and then I began, you know, preparing and taking auditions. Um, I'm sure I had no clue what I was doing um, for many, many of those. Um, and, you know, that's just the reality of how it is now that um, you have to take a lot to usually be successful at them. Um, they're just really hard uh, and it's hard to play your best at them. Um, so, you know, I took a bunch of auditions, um, and I won a job one week before I graduated with my master's, um, which was very convenient timing, yeah. um, cause everybody's panicking as you're coming <laughs> up on graduation of how you're going to make it. Um, so that was amazing. And it was in Tucson, which is still where I play now. So I moved, um, moved out to Arizona. It was a really big change. I think adapting to life after school was really difficult for me for a while. So, Um, And I think that's true for a lot of people, whether you end up staying in the same city and you're freelancing, whether you're having trouble trying to work in your field or, you know, I did get to work in my chosen field, but I didn't know anybody. And I moved across the country and all my friends lived somewhere else. And everyone in the orchestra was like older people. And I'm like, are they my friends or I don't even know. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, there was there was quite a bit of time where it took to kind of figure out what was going on there. Um, so I, I played, you know, in the orchestra, I ended up, you know, working side jobs at, you know, both with freelancing and I did some teaching. Um, I even got some different like part-time work because, you know, we are not, um, we're, I mean, I consider a full-time job, but, Mm -hmm. um, we have a large chunk of the year where we're not working, Okay. but when we're playing, it's, you know, it's a full-time orchestra pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, you know, I was doing that. I got some teaching 
um, opportunities. So I taught at Pima Community College mm -hmm. for several years, I actually did classroom teaching, which I was totally not trained for. <laughs> um, but I just, I heard about the opportunity and I put myself forward for it. And I asked for friends advice on how to interview. And um, I got offered, you know, this adjunct position and I got to teach popular music, which was awesome. Um, so I just, you know, I read the book twice before uh -huh. <laughs> starting the class uh -huh. and just, you know, crashed my way through that, not knowing um, anything about, I mean, I taught a lot of private lessons, but managing a classroom is like drastically different. It dynamic. is, yeah. Um, so as far as like getting engagement, um, I had to like really learn what to, what to do. Um, but then ultimately that experience was really important uh, for getting my job with University of Arizona. So yeah, I also taught um, like a music history survey course, which mm -hmm. was, was really fun. Um, so, you know, I did that for a while. Um, I did end up working in development for a couple of years. I still worked, um, with Tucson Symphony because mm -hmm. we rehearse at night primarily. So it kind of is compatible with doing like a day job. And that's okay. the reason why our schedule is that way, but it's also not for playing principal. It's pretty demanding to do that. <laughs> I would imagine so, but, yeah. You know, yeah, but basically I, you know, um, there are challenges playing in an orchestra and, um, you know, I had served in representative positions and done negotiations and orchestra committee. I even served as president of the local musicians um, union for a couple of years and I was really active on the board. And I kind of thought like I could run this place better than these people. <laughs> um, so I'm like, well, I'm going to go get some experience and, and see about, you know, breaking off and going into arts administration. So I knew that fundraising was really important that even, you know, people say, even if you're an executive director, it's like your executive fundraiser mm -hmm. um, because that's how it works in this country with nonprofits. Like that's how they're supported is, you know, right. grant, grant funding and private so um so i got a great little paid um education about that i oh, wow. i i did a lot of work um i went to a bunch of classes um that were free at the library and like learned how to do development and then i applied for jobs and i got a job mm -hmm. um and then i was able to learn on the job a lot and um so i did learn a lot about um fundraising and administration and what i ultimately learned was it's actually really hard to do a good job. It is. <laughs> and, it's kind of a thankless job. It really is. Yeah. 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 Running an organization, a nonprofit is really hard. Uh, and I saw some really great examples of that. And I thought, you know what? I'm okay not doing that for right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, but I learned a couple of really important things. So this is coming back to like, what am I doing now? Um, one thing that was really important that I learned was that musicians have amazing skill sets mm -hmm. and i know i'd heard people talk about that before but i just i didn't really um, have the confidence to back it up and um, that changed after working in a traditional kind of like nine to five workplace i saw some of the skills that we had that we take for granted i really saw other people lacking those skills mm -hmm. um so i think of especially um leadership and entrepreneurial skills being able to think at the top think of the whole high level and and care about the whole organization rather than just i'm just here to do my job mm -hmm. um, even though we have to train so specifically to play an instrument um we all care about the interpretation that the right. conductor chooses like and we have been taught to care and so that was huge um collaborating with others you know it's with chamber music we're just used to it you know mm -hmm. you respectfully share your opinion and try to work together um not everybody is good at that um yep. you know and even the idea of overcoming challenges for us that's just like what you do like mm -hmm. yeah there's things you don't know how to do all the time and you're like yeah i'm just gonna figure those out um so it turns out getting a regular person job was like just the same way and i mean i, I got a lot of advice too like i mm -hmm. didn't figure this out on my own but you know you can google your way to a lot of information mm -hmm. there, the information's out there um and a lot of what getting a job outside the field of music or any job really is like can you figure out how to do the job not can you do it right this mm -hmm. instant so i learned about that i learned about how to communicate a lot better and then when i was serving on you know representative like on the board for tso i felt like i was coming from such a better position because mm -hmm. i was finally able to communicate with staff and board members 
in a way that made sense to them and not just right. a musician perspective. Um, so that was huge. Um, but ultimately, um, working in development is is almost like the opposite of horn playing in the in that it was completely not up to me whether people would give money i mean i could uh -huh. be nice and i could ask and that's what you're supposed to do but it at the end of the day like i had metrics i had to achieve that i had completely no control over and that stressed me out other people are okay with that but what we do with music there's such a high degree of accountability right. you, you can't be like Oh, I'll just like not play my part and see if nobody notices. Like, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Um, but in some other jobs, you can kind of try to hide um, a little bit. Um, but it just uh, it didn't work for me in that way. Um, but sure. I loved connecting with people. I met I met our audience finally. I'd played in in TSO for over ten years, and I'd almost never really met very many people who were mm -hmm. coming to concerts because there's not really an opportunity to do that. Sure. Um, so I started to understand like the value of us to the community and that was really cool. And I got to hang out with a lot of older people and hear their cool stories. And I love doing that and just connecting with people. Um, I was also working on campus at U of A. So it was a different unit um, than school of music, but I thought, you know what, why have I been avoiding this for like my whole life? Um, being on a college campus is awesome. It's like mm -hmm. super pretty. Yes, parking is a challenge, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, working with young people is really inspiring. Um, why have I not thought that this would be for me? And I, I had been really intimidated by teaching for a long time because you know I had had my own struggles, and we all do with working in the field of music. It's everyone, no one tells you, yes, kid, go into this field; it'll work <laughs> out really well. You know, they always say like, don't do it unless you like absolutely have to, mm -hmm. and it's really hard, and also you're not going to make any money and all that stuff. And you're like, oh yeah, sure. But you're like, well, I'm doing it anyways. Um, you know, it's just that's right. what yeah. we do. So um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I was worried about that. But after I'd had the experience of seeing those music skills in action, I, I completely changed my perspective on it. And, and I felt like, you know what? A music degree is awesome. And it doesn't matter what it leads to. Um, it, it, there's just a beautiful process and integrity inherent in that and the learning we do, we we achieve about ourselves is incredible and um no matter what your goal is or if your goal changes throughout the course of that program and you decide to go a different direction at any point you know great whatever mm -hmm. um but that it's it's really a special thing so um i had applied for a couple of college teaching jobs and um magically got one in the city I was already living in. So awesome. yeah. it is awesome. Um, I was a little worried about it working out that way because I knew that I couldn't really do both jobs mm -hmm. between the symphony and the, um, the teaching. But by being in the same city, it was like really tempting to mm -hmm. keep doing both jobs. So for now I'm doing both jobs. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, and I do think they complement each other really well. Like sure. working with the students makes me excited about playing the repertoire, you know, and then they get to come in here rehearsals and right. that's awesome. And um, there, some of them are experiencing these pieces for the first time. And that's really cool to be a part of. Um, mm -hmm. It keeps me honest with them. Like I have to be in shape. I can't just kind of like, you know, forget how to play mm -hmm. and just teach. So it's really cool. But I, I usually like to say I just have a very full life, which is it is mm -hmm. a blessing, but it's it's challenging <laughs> too. So um yeah, but um that's kind of how I got here. So it, it sure. I, I think that one other thing I just want to say, I know I said a lot already, but um in music, like I did have like a really laser like focus. And I think we're kind of taught that if you don't have that, um you're not gonna make it. And um, that's just really not how life works. Nope, and I know, not at all. And I know <laughs> we're just always like, well, yeah, but I don't care about that. Like, I'm going to do music. Um, but you do end up, like, life does push back on you at some point. And so I think it can go both ways. Like, for anybody who's, you know, you can end up performing even if you didn't take, like, a super crazy serious performance path. Mm -hmm. And you can take the super crazy path and then end up doing something completely different or right. you might weave between it. And like, I think people are open to that a lot more now, especially after the pandemic. Sure. I think, um, you know, there were a lot of ways that people were um, 
afraid to talk about any work that they did that was outside of teaching and performing. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't talk to people a lot when I was doing development. I didn't like broadcast it to the musical mm -hmm. community because it you're there's a fear that people will think that you're not a serious musician um, mm -hmm. if you do that. But the reality is it's like what a lot of people do. And um, we work in the nonprofit sector and you have to find a way to make your finances work too. So you often might need to go outside of just playing or teaching your instrument in order to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So yeah. That's my story. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. That's, that's really well spoken. So um, I guess two, two things occurred to me while I was, was uh, listening to what you were saying. I guess the, the first thing would be they're very lucky to have you at the university of Arizona. And I, I, I hope they understand that. And would, I mean, hopefully they're pretty flexible with the scheduling and that sort of thing. Cause mm -hmm. I imagine, you know, keeping things balanced is, is probably mm -hmm. a, a bit of a challenge, but you're, you're doing a great job of it. Um, and then the second thing I was going to ask is if there were one or two big things that you realized when you were kind of working on the other side of things in development and fundraising that you, that you think the performers should know that you, you know, you mentioned like you'd met people that were in the audience that you hadn't met before, but what's something that, you know, somebody in an orchestra might not otherwise know unless they worked on the development side, but that would be really important for them to understand about how the organization as a whole functions. Yeah, definitely. I learned so much. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, yeah, U of A is amazing about it. And so is TSO. Like they both kind of have mm -hmm. to compromise and, um, but they've, been fine with it so <laughs> um it's which which is great yeah and i think i mean it's part of my identity um it's part of my scholarship so mm -hmm. it's like you know it's it all it all makes sense you mm -hmm. know every every one of us in a, in a college teaching position you kind of have your own identity as right as what scholarly work you're doing and you know for horn like there are people doing all kinds of different things, but you know, it's not like we're playing in salsa gigs or commercial <laughs> music. It's true. like we yeah. play in orchestra. That's like kind of what we do. Right. We like to like get in big groups and play on big pieces in orchestra. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, you know, I, 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 it's very applicable to what mm -hmm. I do a lot more so than maybe someone playing in the back of the string section. Right. right. You know? Right. Um, so anyways, yeah. But um yeah, so in addition to learning the kind of communication and presentation, I think, of, of concepts to others, um, which was a big one, um, I think, I gosh, I just think a lot of musicians would really benefit from, like, holding a day job for a little mm -hmm. while. Um, and this is not to say that we should all, like, cave into management or whatever, but, like, there are a lot of really unpleasant parts of holding a day job. And we do tend to kind of complain about stuff. And I think it's not, it doesn't help us get what we want. Mm -hmm. um, I like, again, I said, I, I'm total union um, all the way. I believe in it. I believe in collective action um, to, you know, achieve, uh, you know, an, an equitable workplace. But um, we have to talk about things in a way that resonates like with the employer mm -hmm. and just kind of talking about our grievances is not really the most productive way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also you, you learn to be like, yeah, well, there's some things that are great. Um, there are some challenges, but like, it's a pretty good job, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, you know, because performing, um, well, gosh, I'll say something else. That may, this may be super contentious, but you have to be extremely selfish to be a performer. Um, you have to just like think about yourself all day. You're like trying to, you know, maybe you go to the gym, you're like trying to rest mentally for your concert and like, mm -hmm. like warming up and like, how's your face? And blah, blah, blah. it's all about you. It's all about you and how you feel. And then like you get there and it's like, oh, I need a chair. I need a stand. I needed this. I needed that. And we're not trying to be like a diva, but... <laughs> it's what's demanded on us because there's such an incredible amount of pressure to literally perform right. in the moment that um, we have to be like focused and, and rested and all of that stuff. And like, once we have to take care of other stuff, it completely destroys our focus. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think we might forget how much stuff is taken care of for us, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, so that is something I've learned about also from doing some of my own, um, like projects where I am putting on concerts and then you really learn about like how much work goes into this or, mm -hmm. you know, I've been one of the people saying before, well, can't they just raise more money? Like, why don't they just, 
raise more money so we can get paid more. Um, yeah, because raising money is just literally asking people to give you their money. I mean, right. Right. or like sell more tickets. Well, you can't like force people to buy tickets mm -hmm. if they would rather go outside or go to a movie or go on a hike or just take a break. Oh, that's another thing. I, I don't know how anyone goes to a concert on a Friday night after working a 40 hour week. Mm -hmm. After yeah. doing a whole week's worth of work, I just want to go to bed. Sure. And yeah. a lot of my friends who work in like not the music field, that's mm -hmm. like what they do. And that's then their you know, entertainment. Kids, yeah. 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 They're like, oh, I finally get to sleep. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and if they have kids, it's even def you know, even crazier. It was like, how do anyone has the energy to like get dressed up and maybe even go out to eat and then go to a concert and then not fall asleep during it? I don't even know. So yeah. I mean, it makes yeah. sense why a lot of our um patrons are older because they have right. the time in their life to do this um because working 40 hour a week is hard and you don't get summers off and you don't get breaks like you just get that little weekend and which sounds like a lot to us because we don't get a weekend mm -hmm. as musicians but the that phrase the daily grind you just don't really feel it until mm -hmm. you've had to be it, you know but they both have really different flows like Something that I try to explain to like non-music people, um, that muggles, uh, you know. Muggle. Yeah, I it, like that. That's pretty yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, like what we do is so concentrated, and that's why like what we do, we can't do it forty hours a week. Like, right. it's like so. I've learned these phrases like I'm working on deadline. Mm -hmm. It's like my entire life is working on deadline. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? But other people are like, oh, oh, you're on deadlines. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not just like getting paid to be here for three hours. Like right. everything yeah. is overdue and I got to get it done. Right. Um, or like every time, pretty much every like work hour that I spend is running a meeting with mm -hmm. another person or group of people. And it's not participating in the meeting. It's literally running the meeting. Right. So my entire day is filled with meetings um, which usually happens like if you're the CEO and if you are, you have an assistant to like take care of all your to-do lists mm -hmm. at the end of the day. But if you're a teacher, you do all your meetings and yep. then at 9 p.m. you write all your emails and like yep. follow up on everything and all that stuff. And it's just I think people also don't understand that about both like higher education and poor like oh, high school the band directors man i just those people mm -hmm. work so hard um but yeah I, I think people think professors are just like sitting around and like you know blazers drinking coffee or something it's like <laughs> maybe in other fields but not in music no we can't afford to <laughs> yeah our, our our you know our field does not grant the returns that you know some fields do and so we're we're always advocating for our you know, our field of study and our position. And this is why music is important. And like you said, these are the skills you can learn that don't necessarily, you don't have to pursue a career in music to take those skills that you learn and be really successful doing something else with them. So it's, uh, yeah, totally. But, uh, well, that that's awesome. And thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think maybe a good way to kind of, um, wind things back to, to the IHS is talk about your new position with the IHS. You're on the advisory council now, and you're now the treasurer. So we're very lucky to have you uh, helping us out with a number of, you know, like fundraising side things, as well as sort of big picture things like, like what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to maybe share a little bit about those kinds of things that might be, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that the average sort of rank and file IHS member might not even be aware of or not even care about, but that's literally what makes the organization able to do what it does the the scholarship programs the you know the the things that are funded by by dollars that are created from the organization not just from membership fees but you know if there is you know uh fundraising outside of membership fees and subscriptions to the horn call so um maybe share a little bit about that yeah absolutely um yeah and this is this is really how i got involved with ihs like from a leader's leadership perspective is because I had that outside experience outside mm -hmm. of music and it was valuable. And I mean, we have such a diverse uh, membership. Mm -hmm. There are people doing, I'm sure every job that's out there mm -hmm. um, in every field, which is so amazing. And it's like the horn is this one thing that, you know, unites us and keep, mm -hmm. you know, brings us together. Um, but being able to use my experience in development and in administration um, for a cause that I really believe in is awesome. 
Um, so I got roped into the budget committee. That was like the start of this because mm -hmm. they had some questions about um, endowment stuff. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I kind of know about this stuff. Um, and so, and they were like, oh good. Cause like, you really don't know about this. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's complicated and you can only, I mean, life is only so long. You can only learn about so many things, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I was really proud to like get to try to help and share what I know. And, um, I'm also learning a lot along the way. So, um, kind of, kind of quickly, like went from budget committee to, um, making a suggestion that then I got to follow up on, which was like, well, Hey, I can help out with this development stuff because mm -hmm. they didn't really have anyone owning that task. Um, and in the past there really hasn't been, um, you know, a, a part of that there's a membership of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, people may think of it all as sort of just like, it's all dollars in the door. Like, what does it matter? But it's like, well, yeah, but there's certain benefits that come with membership and then philanthropic giving is just kind of a different category. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be people who want to and are able to give in a phil philanthropic capacity. Um, and so if we can make that a little easier for people, that's really good for the organization. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's almost primarily a, a volunteer, all volunteer organization. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. run on a tight, you know, budget. It's, it's people are doing this because they care about it. And um, that's, it's awesome to be a part of. Um, so, I mean, I think asking people to help support it financially is um, it feels good. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel, you know, and if people can't, that's fine. Of course, that's how it always, that's always is, you know, um, but um, yeah, getting to know um, Julia and, and Andy, I know Andy's rotated off now, um, mm -hmm. you know, but that was sort of how things started for me. And then uh, we were working together um, just to do a lot of like back end nonprofit-y uh, development stuff. So mm -hmm. there's, there's just lots of, um, uh, registration and bookkeeping and um, kind of stuff that we have to do to be in compliance right. in order to ask people for money. Um, but um, one of the great things is that as long as we don't have a professional fundraiser um, that we pay, you know, kind of allows us to do um, some simpler and it's like already really complicated. So it's mm -hmm. like, it doesn't need to be any more complicated. <laughs> um, I'll just tell you, <laughs> just imagine state by state bureaucracy. Right. Um, right. Being, and every yeah, state's so, different. Yeah. Every state is different. So that was also a really interesting learning curve for me because it was not something that I had dealt with before. And some of these laws were actually kind of like it passed and enacted um, sort of in the in the time since I did the development and then transitioned over to uh -huh. teaching. So lots of learning. Um, so yeah, we're just like working slow and going through it and uh, trying to build that as a, a viable sort of support uh, leg for the organization um, to help support the future of IHS. And um, then that led into me uh, running for treasurer because it, I mean, it really made sense. It's like, if I'm going to be doing the one, which is like sort of this invented um, support position, um, mm. then I might as well do the other because um, I need to know all the numbers and stuff sure. anyways. So, um, but I have to say that being on the executive um, committee has been amazing so far. I just started really in August, but we've met really um, quite regularly. Mm -hmm. And it's a very motivated group of people. It's very international. And um, it's been really inspiring to me to, to get to know the other committee members and mm -hmm. to hear their great ideas. Like, I think again, we all care about this organization, but it's also like, yeah, but who's in charge? But it's like, because mm -hmm. nobody has time to really right. like, because everyone has another whole full-time job and life and all that stuff. But I think we all, we probably can all agree on a lot of things that we wish that IHS could do. Mm -hmm. And so we are, um, this committee, we, we talked about a lot of those things. It's like, can we really try to get those things going? So I, I hope so. Um, so that's kind of a, a cool thing. And I, I know we're all like really excited about, um, coming back together in person. Um, right. So for yeah. for the symposium, you know, I think this almost the IHS is, you know, for some people it's synonymous with the symposium annual mm -hmm. experience. And um, yeah, for anyone who has never gone, I mean, they, they are incredible. Um, one really interesting perspective that I got, um, I was able to go to the one in Ghent, Belgium, which I mean, first of all, was just amazing. It was like one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Mm. Um, but then my husband was actually able to come um, with me for a couple of days and he was like, just totally blown away by it. Oh, He's really? like, I kind of, <laughs> yeah, he was like, I just thought there'd be like a couple people and like oh. kind of like amateur. And I was like, no, 
Um, They're a big deal. He, yeah. It's a big thing. And he was like, this is amazing. He's like, I, I, I would like to come to this. I'm like, awesome. That's great. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was cool. Uh, I mean, and he, he played saxophone. So, I mean, he's not even, <laughs> <laughs> we can't even let him in really. Right, you know, right. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. I mean, so it, I think, and that feeling of community, like for me, it took going to several before I, I know for some people they've been going for years and they just like, they see old friends and it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can be scary because you go and you're like, I don't know anyone. And sure. I feel yeah. really nervous about meeting people. So I've actually felt like that at a lot of them. They're, they're kind of overwhelming. People already know every each other and you're right. like, I'm not in that club or whatever. But, um, you know, I think if, if we can all just try to like, just try to go and be open, be confident and mm -hmm. you are going to meet amazing people and get to have really cool experiences and see things that just like, yeah, you wouldn't get to experience anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, and I know for sure, um, for the upcoming event in Texas, you know, mm -hmm. that Jennifer is really working hard to try to develop some new you know, programs, new ideas, new mm -hmm. approaches, you know, so having like different track for, you know, amateur enthusiasts and then right. for professional and for student and like, so sort of, cause it, they can also be overwhelming just with the amount of content. Uh, yeah. And it's know? hard to know, like, where, like, where do you fit? You know, what am mm -hmm. I supposed to be going to and where is my, yeah. my crowd, so to speak? Yeah. 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 Finding your peeps. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I think that like also the effort that was made for the digital um, to digital experiences these mm -hmm. last two years was really awesome. And so, you know, you know, for anyone who did not check any of that material out, you know, I would, I would convince, you know, try to convince you to give it a try because yep. um, everything that I uh, watched and participated in was actually really awesome. And it's, mm -hmm. it's so much more depth than you would get just from like watching a video online or right. you know, on yeah, social media. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's you know, people really spend the time to prepare either performance or a presentation or a discussion. Um, and it's cool. And then you like, especially when you go to the things that you don't even know maybe what they're about, or you're not sure you're interested in. And then you're like, Oh my gosh, I didn't even mm -hmm. think about this aspect or like historical, uh, natural horn and stuff like that. It's not anything right. that's in my personal, like educational background. So, you know, trying to learn about that is like, wow, sure. wow, this is really cool. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, well, that's a great place to leave it. And thank you so much for speaking with me today, Johanna. Absolutely. 